can see that. Yes, we can see. I can see it. Uh, is everyone able to see? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it pretty much summarizes the way to manage sudden sensory neural hearing loss. I mean, the, the key uh, issues with sudden sensory neural hearing loss are timing of presentation um, and how we deal with the with the uh, um, the, the hearing loss once you've identified it. So um, obviously the uh, important thing is to do a pure tone audiogram so that you can differentiate between conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss. And if it's a conductive loss, then obviously um, the, the management of that is very different. You can sort of put that to one side. Um, but if it's a sensory neural hearing loss, um, you have to be able to define what a sudden sensory neural hearing loss is in order to be able to manage it. So um, the guidance that we've put together is that, and this is pretty much accepted across other countries as well, is that you should have at least a 30 dB hearing loss in three consecutive frequencies that should have come on over a 72 hour period. And um, you know that, that's a, a, a pretty clear definition. Um, there will be people that fall outside that definition, uh, particularly um, maybe milder losses of 20 dB and those that have come on over a, a slightly longer period of time. But I think that's a fairly um, good kind of um, consensus as to uh, as to what we should be looking for. And certainly for exam purposes, I think that's important. Um, so if you've got that sort of hearing loss, um, the conversation you then need to have is, uh, is the eardrum normal? Um, are there any other issues going on? You know, is there a Ramsey Hunt syndrome? Have they had any medication that might be ototoxic? Um, uh, is there any other focal neurology that might indicate a, a reason why they've had this sudden sensory neural hearing loss? Um, have they got any autoimmune diseases or systemic diseases that might be contributing to it? And then the, the other thing, obviously, is to examine the ear. I mean, the vast majority of these patients will have completely normal um, e examinations, um, but there are some rarer things that, that could cause sudden sensory neural hearing loss, um, yeah. which need excluding, um, particularly you know, neoplastic processes and cholesteatomas and, and that sort of thing, but it's pretty unusual to see those. Um, and then uh, there's the, uh, the issue of imaging. So obviously these patients do need to have MRI imaging. It's not urgent, um, but it should be done probably within the six weeks or so of the, uh, of the presentation. And um, the scans that you do would be a standard MRI IAM um, without contrast, just to pick up any specific uh, abnormalities within the inner ear, particularly vestibular schwannomas. Um, so you've di you've identified your sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Your uh, next issue is how to deal with that. Um, and um, although our guidelines here say perform an autoantibody screen, um, I think it's fairly widely accepted. And there's some recently published guidelines from the American Academy of Otology and Neurotology that actually for sudden sensory neural hearing losses, it's really not necessary to do any blood tests for the majority of patients. It's, it doesn't really identify any pathology in in um, the, the vast majority. So in my practice, I don't do any blood tests and, uh, and that's the case for most otologists, I think, these days. Um, the uh, next thing is whether to give oral steroids or intratympanic steroids. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around that area. There's a lot of literature. Um, comparing um, studies, um, systematic reviews and that sort of thing. The strength of the literature is not particularly good. Um, some of you will probably be aware that we are just about to start a national study called Starfish, which is basically looking at the effectiveness of oral steroids versus intratympanic steroids in the management of sudden sensory neural hearing losses. And that's funded by the NIHR um, and led by Cambridge. Um, and um, the reason why that's been funded is that we really don't know whether there's a difference between oral steroids and and um, intratympanic steroids in terms of their effectiveness. Um, but there are some um, 
good reasons to try both either or both i mean i i actually give oral steroids and intratympanic steroids uh, as long as they're within a six week window of their um, onset of of hearing loss and um, some people might say that that's quite a long window um, and cut that down to four weeks but my um preference is to give everybody a chance and i think beyond six weeks there's very little chance of success can't give you very much evidence for that but uh, that's just what i do um with oral steroids i give um 60 milligrams of prednisolone ec once a day for five days i don't taper it off um some people do give a prolonged course and then taper it but there's no need to do that i think if it hasn't worked in the first five days then it's unlikely to so you can just stop it dead at five days without too much complication the problem with oral steroids is that um, they might have side effects um, although um, in a five-day period it's very unlikely that they're going to get any of the major side effects that come from steroids the the um, main thing that they often experience is mood change so some people become quite um, elated other people become quite depressed while they're on oral steroids um, but all the other complications like um, you know cushingoid changes avascular necrosis of the hip um, diabetes they're all kind of long-term risks and i don't think you should worry too much about that the other problem with oral steroids is that there's a blood brain barrier to contend with and the actual amount of oral steroid that gets through to the inner ear is probably not particularly high um, so that may be one reason why the uh, oral steroids are not particularly effective um, in a lot of cases um, um, so that, that's another consideration and there's quite a lot of literature maybe three or four studies looking at the intracochlear dose of steroid when it's given orally compared to intratympanically and the, the actual amount of steroid in the cochlea um, when it's given intratympanically is probably about 100 times higher than it is um, using oral steroids but that doesn't translate into 100 times better effic efficacy um, in terms of, of recovery of hearing after sensory neural hearing loss um, so um, you can certainly give uh, intratympanic steroids as well as oral steroids or you can give them instead of or as a lot of guidelines suggest you could give them following a course of oral steroids if there hasn't been a successful improvement in the uh, sensory neural hearing thresholds um, as i as i've said i think there's no reason not to give both oral and intratympanic at the same time um, that just maximizes the amount of steroid getting into the ear um, so with the intratympanic steroid again there's many different ways of doing it there's different types of steroid that people use my preference is to use uh, intratympanic dexamethasone and i just use the 3.3 milligrams per mil uh, that you get in the vials in outpatients um, that is a relatively low dose of steroid there are some countries where you can get much higher doses of of um, uh, uh, liquid dexamethasone um, but unfortunately not available in this country so the alternative is to use uh, methyl prednisolone um, and that has a much higher uh, amount of steroid in it but it's incredibly painful for the patient so i have used that on a number of people over the years but uh, i've stopped using methyl prednisolone just because some people can't tolerate it because it's so painful and, and I give a dose of um, intratympanic steroid once a day for three days, ideally consecutively. Appreciate that that's logistically quite difficult. So it might be every other day or, you know, worst every three days. But I always try and give it as, as consecutively as possible to try and optimise the amount of steroid that they're getting. Um, and the way that I give that is to uh, lie them on the couch um, with their head turned just slightly away from the side with the hearing loss uh, and then I use uh, the 10% xylocaine uh, spray that you use for anaesthetizing the throat to um, fill the external auditory canal um, and then leave that there for two or three minutes while you're preparing your steroid uh, for injection and then 
suck that out of the ear canal make sure that you've got it all out it's really important not to leave any in the ear canal because if any goes into the middle ear the 10 percent preparation is very strong and it basically anesthetizes the inner ear and they usually get an acute um, vertigo which is pretty disabling for a few hours i've had one patient had to be admitted um, because of some uh, uh, 10 percent xylocaine going in the middle ear so that's that's a much higher dose than what we use in in theatre. We're only using a one percent um, or maximum two percent preparation of um, xylocaine, which doesn't have the same degree of uh, of uh, effect on the on the inner ear. Um, and then once that's um, removed, you can then do your injection. I use a twenty six French spinal needle, um, which is so tiny that it. I've never seen it cause a, a permanent perforation of the tympanic membrane and the passage of the needle through the drum doesn't hurt. But what does sometimes hurt is the actual injection of the steroid. Um, the dexamethasone is not too bad, but as I say, the methylprednisolone is pretty painful. Um, with the dexamethasone, it's only very transient just for a few seconds. And um, you basically slowly inject it into the middle ear you can see the meniscus of fluid raising up um, across the tympanic membrane as you inject the fluid and um, that process takes about 20-30 seconds or so to do the patients often feel a little bit um, dizzy when that's going on I think that's because of the temperature change uh, in the fluid so it's worth um, just warming up the fluid a little bit just up to body temperature um, before you inject it and then uh, when you take the needle out if you've injected it effectively you often get a little spurt of liquid back through the hole that you've made um, but the rest stays in the middle ear and what I then do is um, turn the head a little further away so that they're um, the medial wall of the middle ear is almost horizontal so that if any fluid that's there will sit um, by gravity just over the round window um, and drop the head of the bed a little bit just so that they're not sitting upright because that will or, or they're sitting pretty much horizontally so that the fluid can't dribble away down the eustachian tube and then I tell them not to um, talk during the following 30 minutes or so because every time you talk it encourages swallowing and every time you swallow it opens up the eustachian tube and potentially dissipates the steroid from the middle ear more rapidly than it would otherwise do. There are some people that tell people not to swallow. That is completely impossible to, to uh, implement I think. You know you're asking the patients just to lie there with a, a kidney dish dribbling for the next half an hour um, and uh, yeah, I, I just don't think that's pleasant or necessary. So I don't, uh, I don't ask them to do that. Um, and then after the 30 minutes is up, they get up and can go home. Normally, I ask them to bring somebody with them so they don't have to drive themselves home. But if they don't have anybody, I, I, I don't think it's a major issue by, by half an hour. Um, any dizziness or any problems have, have completely settled so they, they feel pretty well with it. Um, so, and in terms of risks, there's very little risk. I've never seen an infection, I've never seen a perforation, um, I, I've never seen an inner ear um, injury. I have seen dizziness which has gone on for a prolonged period of time and obviously I've seen pain um, but most people tolerate it extremely well. Um, and then the next question is, how effective is it? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer and one of the reasons why we're doing the trial. Um, the literature would suggest that the recovery rates of hearing are between 30 and 60 percent. Um, but there is a spontaneous recovery rate from sudden sensory neural hearing loss, so it's very difficult to know if it's the if it's the steroid that's caused the improvement or whether it would have just got better by itself. Um, and you know, I think the jury's out from this perspective. But I, I'm always, if anything, a bit pessimistic with the patients. Try not to get their hopes up too much because this treatment is less likely to work than it is likely to work. Um, so you know, try and be, try and paint a, a realistic picture for them. Um, so that's my philosophy of 
treating southern sensory neural hearing losses. Um, I don't know whether anybody's got any questions about that. Thanks, Prof. So uh, can I ask about the this uh, period of six weeks? So if you had a patient who exceeded the six weeks, you wouldn't offer any oral or intratympanic steroids, right? Just like we... I think if they've reached the six week mark, I think they've missed the boat really with treatment and then you're just stuck dealing with whatever hearing loss they've got. But we can still inject before six weeks time. Yes, that's what I do. Yeah, and uh, would you offer repeated audiograms after each injection or you're gonna inject the three doses anyway? Yeah, just do the three doses and then do an audiogram at the end of that. Okay. Thank you. And I guess the other thing is that if they've got a partial improvement at that point, whether you go on to give another injection after that, you know, that's also open to debate. Um, it's not that common to find yourself in that position. And I sometimes do do a fourth injection in that situation. But um, again, there's not really a strong evidence base for it. Thank you. So how many patients do you see in the department with sudden sensory neural hearing loss? If you, if you were to guess over a, a month, how many do you think you'd get? Yeah, the the best to ask are the guys who do the rapid access clinic because we're not doing that much autology. So I don't know how many, if the SHOs can reply, please. Uh, I have seen over the last year, maybe one or two cases, but I'm not doing that much of year. I hope I would be, but I injected uh, two patients, three patients. Okay. So do you think we'd get maybe four or five a month, or is that? I think yeah. that, that sounds right. I think that sounds more or less yeah, right. So it's not as it shows at the moment. Oh, sorry. What are you saying, Khalil? Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Sorry. Uh, one of the SHOs that was in the hospital, and we do cover a uh, rapid access clinic, and mm. I tend to see quite. Quite, quite a lot. Like, I'll say more than five a month. Okay. Because I, I think it's one of the things that we should probably be auditing just to make sure that we're doing the right things for these patients. I don't know whether there's somebody that would like to, to take that on. 100%. I'd be happy to do that. Great. Okay. Yeah. I mean, let, let's um, talk about how we do it. But I think if we use the BSO guidance as the sort of gold standard, for for what we should be doing um, and if we can look back through a cohort of patients we've already treated over the last say six months or so and then um, we can introduce that guidance and uh, and reorder and see firstly whether or not we're sticking to the to the guidance but also see whether or not there's an improvement in the in the outcomes for the patients because um, you know that's a fair few number of patients you know 50 patients a year with sudden sensory neural hearing loss that is a lot um, and the other thing is we're going to have to be identifying these patients for the starfish trial pretty soon um, so yeah, we haven't started recruiting yet but within the next three months or so we will be recruiting so um, if you guys can keep your eye out for those patients and let myself or Amma know because he's he's the um, associate PI um, for the MRI site and if any of you work on the Withenshaw site we're also recruiting from that site as well so um, we'll, we'll need to try and get as many people as we can. So actually Amr, oh sorry, Amr is just writing in the chat um, that he had two referrals today uh, in his MROC and he says that he thinks that MRI probably gets more than five uh, but we have an issue with the frequencies of RACs clinic because they're not every week or it just depends so I guess that is a bit we don't really know but more than five and there was a question from Amr as well for you Prof um, he was asking any prognostic factors to consider in terms of hearing recovery with intratypanic injections uh, yes I think the degree of hearing loss is probably a prognostic factor so if you've got a completely dead ear the chances of getting your hearing back are, are pretty poor, um, in fact, probably negligible, but I still think we should try. Um, but And if you've got a, a partial loss, the, loss, the chances of getting a recovery are probably better. Um, the other uh, 
factors might be kind of the etiology. So it, it said that people that have vestibular schwannomas that get a sudden sensory neural hearing loss tend to respond a bit better than than somebody that's got a purely idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Um, there's not a lot of evidence whether that's true or not, but there's a couple of papers out there that suggest that it is. Um, so yeah, those are the main things really. Okay, thank you. And there was one more question, if that's okay, from Liana. Um, she's asking if is if if the hearing ear is affecting and they only have one hearing ear, any changes in the management? Um, not really. I mean, I uh, I don't think oral steroids is an issue. You can give that whatever. I think the interesting panic steroids, you just have to consent them properly, which I always do anyway. I mean, I, I actually get them to fill in a consent form when I'm doing intratympanic panic steroid um, injections um, rather than just, just doing it off the cuff like you would for a microsuction or something like that. Um, and obviously that hearing ear is a very precious ear, so you need to just make them aware that that um, there are certain risks associated with it, but the I think the risks outweigh the benefits because the, the, the complications are extremely rare. Okay. okay, thank you so much. I think that's all the questions. I think that Khalil wanted to ask something. Uh, not at all. I was just uh, I was just gonna excuse my interest uh, in being the uh, primary investigator from the Wisdom Society for this uh, for this study. Sorry, just say that again. It was a bit noisy. Uh, sorry, I'm just outside. I'm happy to help with the study as as the primary investigator from the Wisdom Society if uh, if you need help from from that side. For the starfish study. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, Amma is the associate PI at the moment on the MRI site. I don't know who the associate PI on the Withenshaw site is. So it's I think, it's Avanti. Avanti's going to be leading at our site. Is it okay? So I think I think those posts at the moment are filled, but you know, there's going to be opportunities. I think in the future. So I don't know how long are you around in the department for. Um, I'm I'm around for at least uh, two years, so I'm around. Ah, well, there'll probably be opportunities then, <laughs> depending on whether other people vacate the post. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to drop me an email? Um, so I've got your email address. Um, I will do. I'll and do uh, and then we can sort out what we're going to do with that audit. Fabulous. Okay. We'll do. Sophie, did you have a question? I did. Sorry. Hi. We've not met before. I'm Sophie, one of the advanced practitioners at Withenshaw. I, sorry, I've got, got, I'm off today, but I wanted to join in, so I might have missed. I missed a little bit at the beginning. When a patient comes in with sudden deafness, um, do you normally do an autoimmune screen? At Withenshaw, the consultants, apologies, I've got my little boy with me. The consultants, some consultants recommend an autoimmune screen and, and some don't. So I just wondered what your practice was. Apologies if you've already answered this question. Yeah, we did talk about it, but no, I don't. And okay. most of the, most of the uh, international guidance is that it's not necessary. OK, thank you. That's all right. OK, so if there's no other questions on that, then shall I just share my screen and we can um, talk about vestibular schwannomas? I could talk for about a week on vestibular schwannomas. Um, so I've kind of cherry picked a bit of the information that I think will be most useful to, to you guys. Um, I don't know if I do that, can you see? Can you see that all right? Yeah, I think we, we can yeah, see fine. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. OK, um, so yeah, I mean, we've got we're sort of half an hour into the hour now, but I can talk a little bit longer if you guys have got time. But if if you need to finish by five then then that's absolutely fine um so you'll probably all be pretty familiar with what vestibular schwannomas are i mean the the, the name gives it away it's a tumor that arises from the vestibular nerve either the superior or the inferior um it, it said that the superior vestibular nerve is the more common of the two nerves uh, from it that it arises from and they arise from the sheath of the nerve and not from the nerve itself. So it's not a neuroma, it's a schwannoma. 
Um, and they're the commonest pathology that we see in the cerebellopontine angle, making up 90% of, of pathology in that area. Uh, they, they're completely benign um, and uh, they're generally sporadic, but there is a small proportion that are the result of uh, a genetic condition called uh, NF2 related schwannomatosis, which used to be called NF2 or neurofibromatosis. We've, we've stopped calling it that this year, actually, quite recently, but I'll take, take you through um, that in a minute. Um, and um, they usually start in the internal auditory meatus. It's said that they begin at the junction where the Schwann cells um, start to uh, become less um, dense uh, as the as the nerve travels across the CPA. Um, but whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. Um, this basically shows you where they arise. So this is a T2 weighted MRI scan, axial scan through the skull. So you can see the uh, skin just on the outside there, the black just inside is the bone of the skull. And then this gray area here is the uh, brain. So this is the brain stem, the fourth ventricle, and this um, slightly heterogeneous looking area behind is the uh, is the cerebellum. Um, and the the CSF is this white area surrounding the the uh, brain stem. And the important structure is this little channel here in the bone called the internal auditory meatus, which carries the nerves of hearing balance and facial function. So I think most of you will be pretty familiar with that. Um, you can see the cochlea there, you can see the vestibular apparatus there, and, and that's how it should look. But on this side, you can see a small um, sort of iso intense um, mass uh, filling most of the internal auditory meatus and just poking out of the internal meatus there. So there's a very small CPA component to this tumour. Um, so that's a T2 weighted scan and that is the main screening uh, sequence that we use for MRI of the IAMs. Um, but we always do a contrast enhanced T1 weighted MRI scan um, at least once for these patients and I'll show you why we do that later on. Um, so when you're in an exam situation and somebody asks you what type of MRI scan you do for, a, for an acoustic neuroma or a vestibular schwannoma, um, it would be a T2 weight, heavily T2 weighted axial MRI scan um, through the internal retrimiati and it would be a T1 uh, weighted contrast enhanced MRI, um, again axial, uh, but also we usually do coronal scans as well. Um, so this is the other types of pathology that we commonly see in the in the uh, CPA. Vestibular schwannomas make up 90%, meningiomas make up 3%, epidermoid tumors make up 2%, facial schwannomas make up 1%, and then there's a heterogeneous group that make up all the other pathologies. Um, I won't run through all of those in detail because we're focusing on vestibular schwannomas today. Uh, why is it not working? There we go. Um, so just to quickly touch on the differential diagnosis. So um, vestibular schwannomas are uh, usually ISO intense on T2 weighted imaging. They are hypo intense on unenhanced T1 weighted imaging and they are hyper intense after gadolinium enhancement because they avidly take up the um, the contrast and they're centered around the internal auditory meatus. Meningiomas often also take up contrast, but they tend to have a slightly eccentric position on the IAM if they're arising in that area. Um, they often have a very broad dural base and if you give contrast, they often have a little tail uh, where the uh, adjacent uh, dura takes up the contrasts so, and that and that can often differentiate between meningiomas and uh, vestibular schwannomas. Uh, having said that, it's sometimes actually quite difficult to differentiate between them. Um, the other pathology which you might not be quite so familiar with but can sometimes be mistaken for a vestibular schwannoma is a lipoma. Um, they're congenital tumours. 
um, and you can see some of the imaging characteristics here. So um, this is an, a non-contrast enhanced MR scan, uh, a T1 weighted MR scan, and you can see what looks like a vestibular schwannoma in the internal auditory meatus, but this is a non-contrast scan, so it's high signal on non-contrast. When you give contrast, um, it doesn't change, it still has the same signal characteristics, um, but what you want to do for all all of these potential vestibular schwannomas is do a fat suppression T1 weighted um, scan with and without gadolinium, um, because if you do fat suppression, the fat in the lipoma makes it low signal and the tumour then uh, becomes obviously a lipoma. Um, so you can see um, the um, same uh, lipoma on this right hand um, scan, which is a coronal scan, and the lipoma is this area here, which fat suppresses, so you can't really see it. Um, and then the other thing is facial schwannoma. So one, the, the, one of the reasons we do an, an enhanced MR scan at least once is to see whether or not there are other areas of the facial nerve that enhance, because that can help you uh, differentiate a vestibular schwannoma from a, a facial schwannoma. Um, I mean, in this case here, you can see that there's a bit of tumour in the internal auditory meatus, um, but there's this other bigger uh, element of the tumour here in the geniculate ganglion, which has exactly the same signal characteristics as a, as a vestibular schwannoma, because it's a schwannoma, um, but you wouldn't, with a vestibular schwannoma, expect there to be enhancement in that area of the facial nerve. So that's what you want to look for when you're trying to differentiate a vestibular from a facial schwannoma. Um, and it's sometimes challenging to uh, measure these things. Um, there's an inter-observer error when you're measuring them um, of about two millimetres, so you can't usually say whether or not a tumour is getting bigger with any um, confidence unless it's grown more than two millimetres. Um, this is using uh, linear measurements, and when we're measuring using linear measurements, we usually only measure the CPA component, so we completely ignore the component that's in the internal auditory meatus, and that's because it's really the CPA component that's the most important part. That's the bit that compresses the brain and causes potential complications as it gets bigger. Um, and what we do is is um, draw a line along the posterior face of the petrous bone, so this is the petrous bone here, you draw a line across that and that identifies the um, medial limit of the IAM and you draw a line from the midpoint of the IAM along that line to the furthest medial point of the tumour and then you draw a perpendicular line uh, along the same axis as the posterior face of the uh, of the petrous bone um, across uh, the tumour anteroposteriorly. Um, and that gives you your two main measurements. Um, what we're trying to move towards now, though, is getting volumetric measurements. But unfortunately, the automated volumetric software isn't accurate enough to uh, uh, consistently measure volumes um, in a clinical setting. So we haven't quite been able to move to that just yet. But probably in the next five to ten years, we will have software that will allow us to do that effectively. Um, I won't dwell on the, the um, genetics because it's complicated, but essentially it's um, vestibular schwannomas are caused by mutation in the NF2 gene in the Schwann cells of the uh, vestibular nerve. Um, in sporadic tumours, there's um, a mutation of both copies of the NF2 gene just locally within the, within the nerve, um, but in NF2, there's a um, a genome-wide change um, uh, throughout the whole body in, in most cases, although there are some that just have partial um, mutations across the body. Um, so they've already got one hit of their NF2 gene um, throughout their body that then makes it much more likely that they'll go on to, to develop a second mutation in the NF2 gene in the other half of the of, of, of the cell of the um, uh, genetic material in the cell. Um, but it's not just about Schwann cell proliferation and we've done a lot of work in the last few years here in Manchester looking at the role of inflammation and we've 
clearly demonstrated that um, macrophage uh, proliferation or at least migration into tumours is a very important um, uh, aspect of tumour growth in particular. So um, this is some of our own work looking at macrophage numbers in growing and non-growing tumours. So on the left you've got small static tumour with um, which is predominantly blue in colour because um, the Schwann cells are stained blue and there's very few red um, areas of coloration which is the macrophage staining but in a large growing tumour you can see that the colour is predominantly red and there's a few small numbers of blue cells suggesting that actually the vast majority of cells in a growing tumour are macrophages and we've shown that in a number of different ways both immunohistochemically um, and using PET imaging and using other types of novel MR imaging as well. Um, so uh, this was some work that I did um, about 10 years ago now looking at the growth rates in sporadic vestibular schwannomas um, and we found that about 60% of the tumours didn't grow, 8% um, of the tumours got smaller over time and 33% of the tumours stayed the same size, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, didn't, 33% uh, of them grew. Um, so, th and that's been repeated on many, many occasions with other studies across the world. And that um, piece of information completely transformed the way we deal with vestibular schwannomas back in the sort of 90s. Um, whereas before we would be taking out pretty much all these tumours, um, we now pretty much um, treat them conservatively unless they're over a certain size limit, at least initially. Um, and this just shows you their growth behaviour. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So every time a tumour grows, it falls off the, the uh, population. Um, and you can see that um, the vast majority of tumours, if they're going to grow, tend to grow in the first three years. Once you get past three years, the graph tends to tail off. And by the time you get to eight years, it's very, very unlikely they're going to grow. So if somebody's got a growing a, a stable vestibular schwannoma and it's been stable for more than five years then the chances are it will never grow and it will never need any treatment um the mean growth rate of these tumors if they're going to grow is about two millimeters but the range is quite big so um, they can grow up to about 15 millimeters a year but that's extremely rare um so that takes us on to what we do about these tumours um, and there are really th two main goals um, the first is to control the tumour uh, and the second is to try and preserve function I've put in brackets there to control symptoms as well um, because there are some treatments that we can give that um, control um, symptoms particularly um, vertigo or imbalance and obviously we can rehabilitate other symptoms like hearing loss and, and tinnitus as well um, and these are the different management options. So I've got watch and wait at the top there because that's by far the most common way that we manage these tumours. There's various different types of surgery and I'll touch on some of those in more detail in a minute. And there's various forms of radiotherapy, which again I'll touch on. I've put medical therapy in brackets at the bottom. At the moment for sporadic vestibular schwannomas, there aren't any medical therapies in mainstream clinical use, but in NF2, there are, and I'll show you again later on um, what, what, what the sorts of outcomes you can expect from medical therapies in NF2 are. Um, so the number one message, and this is uh, Labrador enjoying his rest in the evening, um, is that for the vast majority of these tumours, you should do nothing. Um, and if they stay the same size, um, you can pretty much watch them for the entire life of the patient. And that is probably the best way of preserving them functionally. So um, avoid treatment if you can. Um, but this just shows you a broad overview of when we offer various different types of treatment. So at the top, conservative management um, for the most people. But if the tumour is growing, we might consider surgery or radiosurgery. Um, again, we're slightly more conservative now than we have been. We do sometimes watch these tumours grow a little bit until they get to a certain size. That goes back to the paper that we're going to talk about with Haytham. Um, if there's significant brainstem compression, we normally offer treatment. If the patient just doesn't want to live with having a tumour, we might offer them surgery. Um, and if we want to try and preserve their hearing um, over a period of time, then we might offer them hearing preservation surgery. But that has its pros and cons. Um, 
Um, surgery is usually offered as a, a, a default modality for larger tumours um, over 25 or 30 millimetres. Um, if we've got a young patient and they've got a growing tumour, we tend to offer them surgery um, rather than radiotherapy just because um, radiotherapy has some long term risks that are more relevant for um, younger patients than older patients. We'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and again, we might offer surgery if we're going to try and preserve the hearing. Um, and then we offer radiotherapy uh, as uh, an option for pretty much any small or medium sized growing tumour, uh, particularly for the older age groups. Um, and this is our protocol for the watch weight and rescan. So uh, we do a scan at six months that picks up any rapidly growing tumours. Uh, we then scan them annually for three years. We then go to every other year and eventually every three years and then every five years. And then if the patients get too old to want to come back up for an, a scan, we discharge them usually in their sort of late 70s. Um, there is some evidence out there that you could potentially discharge them um, after a, a, a stable follow up period of around 10 years. But currently we're a little uncomfortable with that. Um, in terms of stereotactic radio surgery, um, so stereotactic radio surgery is basically a single dose of radiation. There's various different ways you can give it. Um, in Manchester, we give it using a linear accelerator. Um, Sheffield and a couple of other centres have got a gamma knife machine that's using a gamma source uh, for the radiation rather than um, photons. Um, and there's also the cyber knife, which is a LINAC machine, but with a slightly different targeting technique compared to the LINAC machine that we use. Um, and for those tumours that are slightly larger, where we're a bit uncomfortable offering stereotactic radiosurgery as a single dose, we offer um, fractionated radiotherapy using a LINAC machine. And this just shows you the sort of um, uh, uh, map, map that we use for um, assessing the tumour and making sure that the, the radiotherapy is as focused on the tumour as possible, minimising the amount of radiation that the adjacent tissues get. Um, in terms of surgery, uh, you are probably familiar with the approaches, but um, some centres have a default um, approach as the retrosigmoid approach. That isn't what we use in here in Manchester. For the majority of our cases, we tend to use the translabyrinthine approach, but the retrosigmoid approach is exactly what it says it is. It's a, a window of bone removed behind the sigmoid sinus, um, and that allows you to then get access to the cerebellopontine angle by retracting the cerebellum out the way. So this is the, uh, the, the cranio, uh, cranial uh, flap removed. Uh, and then you make an incision in the dura, fold that forward, and that gets you access into the cerebellopontine angle. Um, the translabyrinthine approach is a more anterior approach, so you're going through the mastoid, and it essentially involves removing the labyrinth. Um, and I'll just show you um, some of the some some diagrams that I've had done just to illustrate this. So the incision is quite far back compared to a normal mastoid incision. Um, you do your cortical mastoidectomy, it's kind of similar to a normal cortical, but it's much wider. So you take the um, drilling up onto the middle fossa dura and well behind the sigmoid sinus. Um, that then allows you to um, identify the sigmoid sinus and depress it so that you can get good access. Um, and you just put retractors in to push the middle fossa dura and the posterior fossa dura away. You then do your labyrinthectomy having identified the middle ear structures and the facial nerve uh, and identify the internal auditory meatus. Um, so you cut a gutter superior and inferior to the meatus so that it's sort of skeletonized around 270 degrees. And then you open up the meatus, um, identify the facial nerve, which is usually just anterior and superior to the, um, the tumor within the meatus. And then the next step is to yeah. open up the um, posterior fossa dura along here, which gives you access into the cerebellopontine angle. Um, and I've put a slide in here just to uh, mention the middle fossa approach. Uh, we do use the middle fossa approach for quite a lot of things, but we don't actually use it much in the UK for taking out vestibular schwannomas. Um, there's a few reasons for that. The first 
being that um, you can only take out very small tumours um, that uh, often aren't really appropriate for um, surgery. Um, so actually we don't find that there's very many indications for using the middle phosphor approach. Um, and this is the view that you get via the translabyrinthine approach. So this is the sigmoid sinus jugular bulb um, and then you've got the um, vestibular cochlear nerve passing across the cerebellopontine angle into the internal auditory meatus. This is the facial nerve, so that's the second genu, that's the incus, that's the stapes, um, and uh, this is the brain stem uh, with the trigeminal nerve and the lower cranial nerves at the bottom here. Um, and then the other thing is obviously that you've got vessels in there as well, so the, the, the anterior inferior the cerebellar artery is the most important vessel. If you damage that, then they often get a brainstem infarct. So we have to be very careful not to not to damage that um, artery. Um, there are pros and cons to each of the management options. Um, so the advantages of conservative management are that it doesn't cause any complications um, and it actually maintains their quality of life, which I'll um, touch on in a minute. Um, the disadvantages are that some tumours grow and um, if you're not uh, keeping a close eye on them, you could potentially then have to deal with a larger tumour. But obviously we do regularly scan our patients and that's a very unusual situation to find ourselves in. The hearing does tend to go off quicker than it would otherwise do with conservative management. Um, and obviously it doesn't modify other symptoms like imbalance, but there are things you can do for imbalance like vestibular rehab and sometimes interesting panic gentamicin. Um, and also if they've got really bad vertigo, you can sometimes take the tumour out and that renders them a vestibular and that then allows them to um, rehabilitate better um, and potentially improves their vertigo. Um, the advantages of microsurgery are that we're able to remove the tumour in the majority of cases and they can kind of draw a line under it um, and then they don't need sort of really long term follow up. But the flip side of that is that there are significant risks with the surgery and I'll touch on that in more detail later um, and also for the vast majority of patients with um, uh, vestibular schwannomas we're not able to preserve the hearing um, I mean to be honest most people that that come to surgery often don't have particularly serviceable hearing anyway so it doesn't matter too much to those patients but it, it is something to consider for some of the patients um, and the advantages of radio surgery are that it's a single day of treatment, that they, they tolerate it extremely well. Um, short term, the hearing is preserved and there's fewer complications, um, certainly lower risk of facial nerve palsy. But there are longer term risks with radiotherapy, which means that for younger patients who are a bit reluctant to use it. So those risks are inducing new tumours in the area of the radiotherapy and also converting what is a benign tumour to a malignant tumour. Um, and also there's a slightly higher risk of um, inducing stroke in the long run um, in radiotherapy patients. I mean, these risks are sort of one in a thousand, so it's not a major deal, but certainly in the young patients that is a consideration. Um, and this is what we do in the UK. So this is based on the UK vestibular schwannoma audit from 2019. We, we do the audit every year um, and you can see that uh, the different sizes of tumour. So Coos grade is basically intracanalicular grade one, um, tumours that haven't touched the brain stem um, grade two, tumours that have just touched the brain stem grade three and tumours that are con con causing considerable brain stem compression grade four. So virtually everybody in grade one, two gets watched initially, but as you can see, um, the upfront treatment changes as, as the tumours get bigger. So more likely to get surgery um, with the grade three and even more likely to get surgery with the grade four. We tend not to offer radiotherapy as a primary modality. Um, we usually offer it if the tumour is growing, um, but there are some centres that offer upfront radiotherapy, even if they've got no evidence of growth. Um, so in terms of tumour control rates, um, we've talked about the control rates of watch weight and rescans, about 33 to 40%. The control rates of radiotherapy are about 5%. Um, those tumours that grow despite radiotherapy usually need surgery. Um, 
and then the success rates for or the control, tumor control rates for surgery, if we get a total removal, which we're able to do in 80 percent of cases, there's a one or two percent chance of recurrence. Um, obviously, if we thought it was total removal and they get recurrence, there wasn't a total removal. Um, if we get a near total resection, which is less than 5% of the um, volume of the tumour, then there's a 5% chance of regrowth. And if it's a subtotal removal, which is anything greater than 5% of the tumour left behind, there's an 8% chance of regrowth, although that is stratified according to how much of the tumour you leave behind. Um, there has been a, a trend in recent years to do an elective subtotal resection. Uh, and then give radiotherapy. Um, the reason for that is that if you do a subtotal resection, you're less likely to damage the facial nerve. Um, but but the problem is then you have to give radiotherapy and you could potentially get risks from the radiotherapy and from the surgery. And I think the, uh, the, the uh, jury's out in terms of whether that's actually the right way to go. And it certainly isn't our policy in Manchester. We always try and remove the tumour if we can. Um, these are the hearing outcomes for conservatively managed patients. The, the bottom line is if you've got serviceable hearing when you present, then you've got about a 50% chance after five years that you'll still have serviceable hearing. Um, and this is some data from work that I did a few years ago. Um, and um, this is a really good systematic review done by Matt Carlson from the Mayo center in the states comparing um, hearing preservation rates in conservative um, conservative managed patients versus surgery versus radiotherapy and um, that he stratified them according to the point at which you're looking at their hearing and um, so immediately following treatment um, there's unlikely to be any impact on hearing with radiotherapy or conservative um, if you're doing hearing preservation surgery surgery um, there is a moderately low chance that you'll be able to preserve their hearing. Um, at two years, um, sorry, moderately low chance that they'll have hearing loss following um, hearing preservation surgery. At two years, there's a moderately high chance you'll have hearing loss with radiotherapy um, and a high chance that you'll have uh, hearing loss with conservative management. But if your hearing preservation surgery has been successful, your hearing should be preserved. Uh, at two years and it's a kind of similar situation at five years and at 10 years um, a, a moderately low um, chance of having good um, hearing preservation. Um, I'll just skip over that um, just to briefly mention what we've been doing for our patients for the last few years pre-operatively in order to try and control their balance problems post-operatively is to render them a vestibular before they have their surgery. So we give a course of intratympanic gentamicin, make them a vestibular, uh, and then when they come to have their surgery, they don't have to contend with both the, the acute vertigo from the sudden loss of balance function from the trans lab, as well as the big insult of having a, a, a major intracranial procedure. And we found that that shortens our length of stay. Um, it, it makes them get home quicker. Yeah. Um, and it makes them quicker to independently mobilise. So this just shows you the independent mobilisation data in the intratympanic gentamicin group. There was uh, a two a two days until they uh, mobilised independently compared to the group that didn't have any intratympanic gentamicin, which is five days. And this is their length of stay data. So the average length of stay if they've had intratympanic gentamicin was four days compared to seven days for the intratympanic gentamicin group, uh, the no intratympanic gentamicin group. So we found that a really helpful intervention. Um, in terms of facial nerve outcomes, this is the national database outcome. I won't dwell on that, but this is our own um, surgical outcomes for uh, facial function. So this is our last 521 patients. Um, and you can see basically um, the different House Brackman grades. So blue is grade one, um, orange grade two, grade, grade three, yellow grade four, blue, oh, that's another blue, light blue grade five and green grade six. So for the intracanalicular tumours, almost all of them get grade one facial nerve outcomes. And the same is true of the, the uh, tumours up to about 20 millimetres. And then above 20 millimetres, the, the facial nerve outcomes get worse. Um, the main thing in terms of quality of life for vestibular schwannoma patients is their balance. 
and, and this is another bit of work that I did a few years ago that um, looked at quality of life and how important that is uh, and what factors are important and it shows that using the SF36 uh, that the scores for those patients that have uh, imbalance are much poorer than they are if they've got no balance problems um, so we always try and optimize the balance as much as we can either through vestibular rehab or through intratympanic gentamicin or sometimes taking the tumor out um, and in terms of quality of life we've just completed a, a quality of life study comparing the three modalities and the changes in quality of life over time um, I'm not going to go into the details but surprisingly for small and medium-sized tumors the long-term quality of life, and that's kind of a year or more after um, treatment's completed, the quality of life between those having watch weight and rescan is the same as for stereotactic radiosurgery and for microsurgical resection. Um, in terms of other complications, uh, you can see the list of complications that you get with surgery here. So um, nationally, there's a 7.5% CSF leak rate, 2% risk of meningitis, 2% risk of stroke, um, and uh, a, a less than 1% chance of dying as a result of the surgery. Um, so surgery is not a main, isn't a minor undertaking. You know, you've, you've got to really counsel the patients well, and they've really got to want to go ahead with it. If, um, but they they do have the benefit of having had the tumour removed, and then they can draw a line under it. Um, and these are the risks of radiotherapy. Uh, you can see there from the percentages that the risks are very much lower. There's only a um, one or two percent chance of facial palsy with stereotactic radiosurgery compared to anything from two percent to twenty percent, depending on the size of the tumour with surgery. Um, this is the paper that uh, Haytham was talking about. Um, it's again a paper from the Mayo Clinic that looked at the point at which the outcomes of surgery and radiotherapy. Um, sorry, just surgery get worse um, and um, our ability to achieve total resection starts to go down after 17 millimetres. Conveniently, the uh, chances of getting a house Brackman grade one starts to drop once the tumour gets beyond 17 millimetres. Um, and similarly, um, the chances of being able to preserve the hearing if you're attempting hearing preservation surgery is also around 17 millimeters. So that's the number to remember if you're um, uh, monitoring tumors that are growing. We, we usually call it a call a day at, at around 17 millimeters and say, right, that's the point at which you need to have treatment. Um, just to quickly touch on NF2 related schwannomatosis. So this used to be called neurofibromatosis type 2. Um, but neurofibromas don't occur in NF2 and um, uh, it, it gets confused with NF1, which is a completely different genetic condition. So um, after many years of wrangling last year, we uh, decided to change the name of NF2 to NF2 related schwannomatosis. Um, so the, the schwannomatosis conditions are um, several um, and they are now named according to the genetic mutation that caused them. Um, schwannomatosis basically means that you've got a genetic predisposition to developing schwannomas and if you've got um, NF2 you've got mutation of the NF2 gene and that's therefore called NF2 related schwannomatosis. If the schwannomas are caused by mutations in other genes like the LZTR1 gene or the SMARC-B1 gene then um, they're called LZTR1 related schwannomatosis and SMARC-B1 related um, schwannomatosis. So uh, although it's going to be confusing for a little bit while we get used to causing and calling it something different, I think the, the name NF2 related schwannomatosis is probably a much better name than what we were using before. And this is the um, original classification for NF2. Um, it was developed in Manchester in the late 1990s and was used worldwide um, to classify uh, NF2. Um, unfortunately, it included a couple of things that aren't part of NF2 at that stage because we didn't really understand the disease quite as well as we do now. And we included things like gliomas and neurofibromas, which aren't actually part of NF2. So we then modified it um, and uh, this is the new NF2 related schwannomatosis diagnostic criteria. So um, to have that diagnosis, you've got to have bilateral vestibular schwannomas 
or you've got to have identical identical NF2 mutations in at least two anatomically distinct NF2 related tumours, whether that's schwannomas or meningiomas or ependymomas, or you've got to meet um, either two major or one major and two minor criteria as outlined here, which I'm not going to dwell on too much. Um, and uh, it's an autos autosomal dominant condition. As I mentioned to you before, there's usually a germline mutation throughout the body with um, a mutation of one of the copies of NF2 gene that then makes it much more likely that you're going to get a, a, a tumour if there's an, another hit to the um, a second copy of the NF2 gene. There is a few patients that get something called mosaicism where not all of the um, cells in the body have the NF2 mutation and they have milder disease. Um, and in the UK, there, or at least in England, um, the management of NF2 is centralised to four centres, um, one of which is Manchester. Um, and just to quickly mention medical therapy, I sort of touched on that earlier on. Uh, that we do use medical therapy to treat NF2, um, and the drug we use is something called Avastin or Bevacizumab. That is a, a vascular endothelial growth factor antibody so it basically binds to the VEGF receptor and uh, the VEGF receptor is normally stimulated by VEGF to um, cause angiogenesis so production of new blood vessels and if you block the receptor using bevacizumab the VEGF can't bind and it stops the tumour developing a blood supply so that then stops the tumour from growing because it needs blood to, to grow. Um, and this is our series from about five years ago or so now. Um, and um, you don't need to worry too much about the graph, but the bottom line is that this drug controls the growth of rapidly growing vestibular schwannomas in NF2 in about um, 70 or 80 percent of cases. Um, so it's a very successful treatment and it's completely revolutionized the way we manage NF2. But unfortunately, it's given intravenously and it does have certain side effects and it's also extremely expensive. So it's not something that we could use in a sporadic population. Um, but there are um, lots of other potential drugs that um, we could use. There's a drug trial going on at the moment um, in the States looking at the effectiveness of aspirin. There's also been a couple of drug trials looking at the effectiveness of metformin. Uh, I have to say neither of those have been particularly successful so far. And there are other um, uh, immunomodulating drugs that, um, targeting various parts of the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, mitotic um, process um, that are, are potential um, uh, drugs that might be successful in in uh, in NF2. But again, they're pretty early on in their trials. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about. Uh, I hope that was helpful. And if there's any questions, just ask them. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think there is any questions in the chat. OK. Anything anybody wants to ask live? Well, thank you so much, Prof. You have uh, included everything we have been considering in sensory neural hearing loss and uh, vestibular schwannoma management uh, from A to Z, uh, honestly. And the paper you uh, proposed was quite nice because it was uh, describing or talking about the decision making process about uh, when to operate on the VS uh, over the weight and scan uh, protocol. Uh, I'll just, I'm going to ask a few questions before going quickly through the paper, if you don't mind. If we are talking about, uh, anyway, we are considering non -ser uh, serviceable hearing for patients who are having the surgical pathway. Uh, but what after taking out the tumour in a sporadic uh, VS, are we considering uh, a bone conduction device on this side, which we have resected, or are we considering, uh, I don't think a cochlear implant would be an option, if unless we're going retrosigmoidal. But in your patients, have, how have you been rehabilitating hearing after resecting the tumour? Yeah, so it depends on the type of surgery. So if they've had hearing preservation surgery and it's been successful, then 
hopefully you wouldn't need to rehabilitate it um although you can use a hearing aid if they've still got some hearing loss um for those that have completely lost their hearing on that ear um the most of them actually don't really want any hearing rehabilitation and we do offer them um hearing rehabilitation um, and the main options are a cross aid or um, a bone conduction hearing implant of some sort whether that be a baja or a bone bridge or um, the new ossia device from cochlear um, and they basically just transfer sounds from the deaf side to the good side so i mean the benefit you get is fairly limited it doesn't really help you in a noisy room it doesn't really help you identify where sounds are coming from but it does help you if you've got somebody sitting on that side of you to hear what they're saying. So some people do like it, um, some people don't. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that the, the, the take up is particularly high. Um, in terms of cochlear implants, we actually do have a, a, a proportion of patients that have cochlear implants. They're mainly in NF2 because in the UK, we can't implant patients that have got good hearing in the other ear. Um, so it's really only the NF2 patients that are bilaterally deaf. Um, uh, and as long as you've got an intact cochlear nerve, you can use um, the uh, cochlear implant to augment the hearing. Um, the, um, the cochlear nerve is often intact if you do a retrosigmoid hearing preservation surgery that's failed. Um, yeah. And you can do translabyrinthine surgery and preserve an intact cochlear nerve. So um, it is possible to have a translab and still have a cochlear implant if you if you're able to preserve the cochlear nerve. But that's not possible in all cases. Uh -huh. Great. Any other questions, guys? No, really, not for me. And I can't see any any other questions from anyone else. OK, that's great. Uh, got one. Do you ever have to do an ABI? Oh, yeah. So uh, yes, in NF2, we do do ABIs. Um, they're patients that uh, are having uh, vestibular schwannomas removed that we're not able to preserve the cochlear nerve for. Um, and uh, most of these patients are already profoundly deaf on the opposite side. Um, so you're going to render them deaf in their only hearing ear. So we then use an ABI to uh, rehabilitate hearing in those patients. And that the ABI basically stimulates the hearing system at the level of the cochlear nucleus. So we place the paddle of the uh, ABI in uh, the foramen of Lushka adjacent to the cochlear nucleus and stimulate the cochlear nucleus. Um, and the reason we have to do that is that we can't use the cochlear nerve or the cochlea to stimulate because there's no connection between the cochlea and the and the brain. The outcomes of the ABIs are pretty poor in comparison with um, cochlear implantation, um, probably for two reasons. Firstly, that the cochlea is nicely tonatomically arranged, whereas the cochlear nucleus isn't. And also there's quite a lot of sound processing that goes on between the cochlea and the cochlear nucleus, and you've lost that if you're stimulating at the level of the cochlear nucleus. Okay. Thank you so um, much. That's all right. Prof, can I, if I can share my screen just to go through the paper quickly? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you see my screen, right? Uh, so this was the paper we have uh, gone through and I uh, used uh, um, the C uh, CASP uh, checklist for appraising this uh, study, which I think it has been a retrospective uh, cohort study, uh, or we can say descriptive uh, actually, but uh, going retrospectively through the department which was the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota uh, with the VS surgical patients which they have gone through uh, 
uh, gathering over the 20 years from 2000 to 2020 around 866 patients all surgical patients and the inclusion criteria was 603 patients actually and uh, the outcome was based on three things which is the resection and the house Brackman grading of the fission nerve and the hearing outcome so the three things were compared uh, all uh, through the patients with the surgical outcome being into three categories the as prof said before the gross total resection or the near total or the subtotal and the idea here is to compare the op notes which they have a surgeon described after surgery if they have been happy with resecting the whole tumor or left a very small remnant around uh, less than five millimeter uh, intraoperatively or they have seen a solid mass intraoperatively and it has been detected on MRI scan so this has been the three categories in order to describe the resection. The other thing was the house Brackman as for having or getting into this C index curve, they had to put it in a binary uh, style in order to compare each millimeter in size with a yes or no in order to detect or get back to the point of 14 to 20 millimeter in range with the 17 millimeter as a decision when the patients are really having uh, comparable outcomes for the three categories which we have been considering in the study. So in order to know uh, and or in order to reach this curve, they had to put it into a binary and a C index, uh, which we can, I don't know if it is a rock curve or not, but this has been the outcome described based on the size and the three things they have went through. Uh, House Brackman, facial nerve assessment was done immediately after surgery or roughly as a recent when they put it on the curves here it has been within the 14 days post-surgical in order to detect how was the facial nerve after surgery uh, so actually they had a good sample size of 603 patients and the impact factor of the of the journal is quite high it's 5.1 and it's a recent study with the validity and the uh, the validity of the results and the reliability actually uh, they have gone if we can say that this study was only done in a single center but with a group of surgeons who agreed to go for the retrosigmoidal or the trans lab uh, approaches for the CPA angle uh, schwannomas and the exclusion criteria was quite clear here when they mentioned that they are not including any patients with NF2 or patients who has had radiotherapy before, or patients who had any intralabyrinthine tumors, or inadequate imaging, or uh, lack of medical records after it has been back to 2000s. So all of these patients have been excluded. So we can say that there hasn't been much of uh, confounding uh, factors in this study. Um, the other thing is with the objective measures they have gone through, it was quite clear for the results and the stats so uh, they have used the c-index as i have said and going through the demographics of the tables everything was non-significant for the age the sex the tumor size and the solidity of the of the tumor as well so the demographics haven't been an issue with the results they have reached it was based on the size in order to compare it to the three outcomes as for the hearing loss the word recognition score where which are the american Academy uh, classification as AB as serviceable and CD as non serviceable. Uh, they used the interquartile uh, ranges for their uh, results. Uh, and they described the limitations of the study as well, which was uh, quite good, as they mentioned uh, that they haven't uh, included any patients with complications as CSF leak. And they don't know uh, in this type of study what would be the effect of radiotherapy. So it was purely based on the surgical patients only. Uh, they hoped they could have at some point a comparison between the radiotherapy and the surgery, uh, which is quite important, especially that within the range of size we're talking about, it's around 14 to 20, which is one of the indications for radiotherapy. So uh, this is one of the important things uh, as a limitation of this study. Um, the tumor adherence and the consistency, well, as 
as they have been going through the op notes, uh, I think this is something which hasn't been agreed for before the study, but that's what they had in hand in order to know if this is a near total or subtotal resection. Uh, and compare that to get back to the tables they have uh, drawn actually. Uh, so this is this is one of the limitations. And after going through the future studies, they mentioned that they would like to. Uh, where was it? Uh, yeah, that was the concept of performing near total and subtotal uh, resection uh, range. Uh, this wasn't directly evaluated in this study as they have been totally concentrating or focusing on the gross total uh, resection. Uh, so I think, yeah, the this curve explains everything for the size and when to consider, uh, as Prof said, uh, the surgical uh, decision and deciding with the patient when to go for surgery, um, weighing up the risks, the pros and cons, and, every, and the quality of life after surgery. So I would recommend this paper in our practice. Uh, but again, it, we, we, we can get back, Prof, to the question, if I can ask you, about the radiotherapy or surgery here. So within this size, which is less than we have been describing before as a 25 millimeter, are we still considering surgery versus radiotherapy, or is it just like to recommend it in this size as for this paper? Uh, yeah, I mean, th this group of patients are, are up to about 18 millimeters, well, up to about 25 millimeters, in fact, um, would be candidates for either surgery or radiotherapy. And I think the crux of this paper is basically that we can potentially watch tumours grow uh, if they're growing slowly up to the point where the risks of the intervention start to get worse. So, uh, and, and it seems based on their data that that point is 17 or 18 millimetres. So if you've got a intracanalicular tumour and it's growing two millimetres a year, you might have an extra five years maybe before you'll get to the point where it reaches 17 millimeters um, so you can potentially preserve their quality of life over that five-year period by not intervening um, without potentially compromising the outcome of their treatment and that's a relatively new concept in vestibular schwannomas you know up until recently when we've seen growth of the tumor we've gone right okay it's growing we're going to we're going to um, intervene. Um, but, you know, even on my series of patients that I analysed a few years ago now, there was a 20% chance that, that a growing tumour will stop growing. Um, so that's the other, that's that, that, that more conservative approach where we're watching tumours that are growing slowly up to a certain size point. Uh, it means that there'll be some patients that would have ended up having surgery or radiotherapy unnecessarily because they would have potentially had their tumour stop growing over time. So, um, you know, I think that paper is going to be quite influential in the way that we manage our patients in the long run. And if they included the radiotherapy treatment patients or the radiosurgery, uh, SRS, would that get, get more results or something? Would that be affecting those numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be useful to repeat it with radiotherapy. Um, the, the, you know, I think those curves will be slightly different. I, I don't think there's such a size related um, uh, variation in outcomes um, in the in the measures that they were looking at. So in terms of facial function, the facial nerve outcomes are very good for radiotherapy, no matter what size the tumour. Um, the growth rate control is probably similar for small and medium sized tumours, irrespective of how big it is, but maybe for the bigger tumours, it wouldn't be so effective, but we don't tend to irradiate those patients anyway. So it'd be quite difficult to do the study with, with tumours that are very large. Um, so I, 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 yeah, it would be helpful to repeat it with radiotherapy, but it'll be a slightly different curve that we get. Today in the skull base MDT, I was I was attending. It was quite uh, interesting and educational, to be honest. You have been asking about the how to measure 
the tumor. Is that correct? It was that the AP or the lateral, I think, because I, I didn't get that. Was that the point you described about the, the perpendicular to the line to the Peter's apex and getting to the CPA? That's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's many different ways you can measure a vestibular schwannoma, um, but the vast majority of centres just use the CPA component and they draw a line across the, the porous, which is the opening of the IAM, and then they measure um, from that point to its most medial point, and then they draw a line parallel with the posterior face of the petrous bone and, and measure the diameter of the tumour at that point too, so you get two measurements. Um, but even then there's still variation. Um, there's there's no, no way around that. I think until we've got a reliable way of measuring volume, uh, we probably won't really reduce the intra-observer error very much. Okay, thank you. Getting back to the sudden sensory neural, if the patient regained his whole hearing, are we still offering an MRI scan? Uh, good question. Uh, I think probably yes, um, but yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. I think my my preference would be just to do it anyway. Okay, yeah, just something to learn and uh, to consider. Even if the patient had an episode of sudden sensory, this doesn't mean that it would reoccur and it would show us something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's probably a viral etiology for most people if it if it recovers. Um, uh, you know, I obviously don't have a lot of evidence for this, but I think the ones that are vascular in origin probably are harder to recover from. Um, but there's no way of differentiating viral from vascular. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to see if that pans out, if there is ever a means of, of assessing that. Yeah. Uh, this is... Uh... A little bit advanced question. If you have a NF2 patient with bilateral VS, would you choose one side to start with? Is it the worse hearing or the bigger tumor? Uh, well, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> it depends on the circumstances. Um, you know, if, if if you've got a rapidly growing tumor, um, then we would usually use a Vastin first line to try and control the growth. Um, and if it's still growing despite Avastin, then we would we would treat the rapidly growing tumour. Um, you know, the, I mean, there are some circumstances where we might choose to treat a very small tumour that's not growing. So, you know, if they've lost their hearing in that ear already, we might decide to try hearing preservation surgery. Uh, we might try um, removing the tumour and using a cochlear implant if they've got very poor hearing already um yeah so there's it's such a multifactorial decision that, that there's no one right answer really yeah if if you are yeah i'm talking about real life the patient is having a 25 millimeter tumor which is on the borderline of giving radiotherapy or surgery is it to the patient to decide about having srs or surgery or are you recommending one modality over the other, considering that the patient is having his hearing? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the circumstances again. So if you've got a 25 millimeter tumor, you're at the upper uh, upper limit of what might be appropriate for a stereotactic radiosurgery treatment. Um, so we might decide to fractionate radiotherapy if that's what the patient wants. Um, and I suspect at 25 millimeters, uh, particularly if the patient is young, the radiotherapist probably will be getting a bit uncomfortable with that and they might well sort of point the patient in the direction of surgery. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's the patient's decision. Um, so if we have got patients that have had quite large tumours irradiated um, and they've stabilised and never had to have any other treatment. So, you know, it's a conversation that we have between ourselves and with the patient to decide what the best course of treatment is. Amazing. Thank you. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you guys. Hope it Thanks, was helpful. Prof.